This talk is diametrically opposite to most, possibly all, of the other talks in this conference. So I'll spend the first 10 minutes uh, giving some philosophical background to motivate the second half of the talk. So the first part is about the problem. The second part is some aspects of the solution. Uh, the problem divides into the hard problem, which you're all familiar with, which is what is consciousness? How does it relate to the physical world? And the second part is looking at some modeling questions within certain answers to the hard problem. The problem uh, of the hard problem, I suggest, is the solution is mental monism. Uh, mental monism is a theory that there's nothing else but consciousness in reality. And this implies certain technical problems in modeling the world. And I'll be looking at discrete systems and automata theory within mental monism. So this whole thing starts off, obviously, with Rene Descartes and the mind-body problem, which uh, in more recent times, David Chalmers has rechristened as the hard problem of consciousness. Now, there's four possible solutions to this problem. One is physical monism, the idea there's nothing in the world but physical stuff. This is the most common view of many people. Dualism, there's a conscious world and a physical world. Mental monism, there's nothing but consciousness. And mysterianism, we're never going to figure it out. Well, physical monism we know is wrong because it excludes consciousness that we're aware of every single moment of the day. Dualism is wrong because it just doesn't work. <laughs> Mysterianism isn't going to get us anywhere, so the only game left in town is mental monism. <laughs> this was proposed in the West by George Barclay and in the uh, Hindu system by Adi Shankara. But it ha although it has been the uh, subject of, of, of humor for many centuries, past three centuries, it is now having a resurgence. And even respected figures like David Chalmers is saying, well, it might possibly be true. So this is the proof in two slides of mental monism. I'll run through it very quickly. I've been through this in other occasions. I'm not going to spend the time here going through it in detail. Physical terms are derived analytically from undefined fundamentals like mass and charge. Mental terms are derived from private ostensive definition, like red. You understand the term red because you see something red. Therefore, physical propositions can never yield any mental propositions. Therefore, all mental facts are non-physical. Obviously, this is a very hand-waving quick thing, but it is valid, I can assure you. And um, you can read expansions of it in my papers. Uh, second part of the argument, a term can make reference only to what is known, but the non-mental world is unknowable. All we know is our sense state and prison actual experiences. Therefore, the existence of a non-mental world cannot meaningfully be asserted. Therefore, a non-mental world doesn't exist. Therefore, mental monism is true, QED. <laughs> so uh, that answers the hard problem. Now, the slightly less hard problems of modeling consciousness within mental monism. And as I said, I'll be looking at discrete systems and automata theory. Why is it even a question that we need models? Well, in physicalism, it's easy, comparatively easy, to uh, uh, model the, the mind because it's all driven by the brain. What the brain does, it gives us a conscious mind. In mentalism, mental monism, the model has to bootstrap itself. We have to explain consciousness in terms of consciousness. So that's a bit tricky. But uh, OK, that's what I'll it down. Physical realism, structure and dynamics of the mind are driven by brain processes. In mental monism, the structure and dynamics of the mind must be bootstrapped from mental processes themselves. But it's worse than that, because not only do we have to explain the mind in terms of the mind, we have to explain the brain in terms of the mind, because the brain is simply a construct the mind has invented. And it's even worse than that, because you have to explain the whole world in terms of consciousness. Because if there's nothing but consciousness, then everything has to reduce in some way to conscious processes. As I said, this is the exact opposite of what most people assume. They assume that there's a physical world and the consciousness is a strange thing that happens in brains. This is the exact opposite. So there are two kinds of models that we need. One is the interface model and the other is I call a structural model. Why do we need models at all? Because some people have a kind of straw man view of mental monism, that it's a magical deus ex machina. Uh, Roger said it was woo-woo chicanery. Uh, Dan Dennett refers to it as a reversion to pre-modern unscientific dark age thinking. It's none of these. It's a rational hypothesis about the way the world works. And we have to eventually formulate a rigorous model 
and tested empirically. At the end of the day, if mental modeling doesn't work, then it doesn't work. But I think it does. So this is the view of the universe within mental monism. We have individual minds, and there's some kind of background mind. Uh, Barclay called it God. Shankara called it Brahman. Uh, I call it the meta mind because it shaw uh, removes any religious references to it. A cloud represents a mind, by the way. So we have what Heisenberg called the physical construct. This is what we take to be the physical world around us, and that contains avatars of the minds, which we regard as human bodies, but they embody the consciousness within this construct. And then uh, the meta mind is like an operating system that runs all the physical processes of the world. So we have an interface model, which I talked about in the Interlaken conference earlier this year, which defines how the consciousness relates to the physical construct. And then we have the structural model, which I'll say something about now, well, a few minutes. So the first result comes from that two slide proof of mental monism, that reality consists of a set of minds, nothing else but those minds M0, which is the meta minds M1, M2, etc. a finite or possibly countably infinite set of minds. And one consequence of that is that minds do not exist in physical space. Physical space is part of the physical construct and minds don't exist in it. So that uh, constrains somewhat the models that we will develop. My first hypothesis of seven for modeling the conscious mind is that it's discrete. Uh, this may be wrong, but it's, uh, I think, a plausible hypothesis because when we look at our sensorium, we find there's a finite resolution of time and space and also of qualities. It appears that what we experience is made up of discrete elements moving in discrete time. So that is a starting hypothesis for formulating a possible model. The second hypothesis is what I call naturalism, that the time evolution of a mind depends on itself. In other words, the state of the mind at any given moment in time depends on the state of the previous time, including any inputs, as opposed to being magically dependent on something else elsewhere. And I'll add into that volition. So uh, you notice there's an element sign there. So the state of the mind at a given time is driven by a function that derives a set. And the choice of a particular element within that set uh, is volition. We're not going to refer to that, just throwing it in because clearly we do have free will, so it has to be in the model somewhere. So the first problem that we have to face is how do two minds communicate, whether it's personal minds or the meta mind and a personal mind? Well, within physicalism, it's easy peasy. The brain drives the mind and brains communicate. So my mind talks to your mind through brain and the acoustic signal, single signals of my mind, of my voice. Sorry. Uh, in mental monism, we don't have any brains. So how do we communicate? How does one mind communicate with another mind, given there's no physical brain to do the communication with? Well, what if there's some intermediate mechanism between two conscious minds that somehow conveys information between minds? Well, there's a problem there. Because in mental monism, there is nothing but minds in reality. So whatever that intermediate mechanism must be, it's another mind. But then you've got a regress because Mind A communicates with the medium from a volition giving rise to an experiential, and then the medium has a volition giving rise to an experiential. So you haven't explained anything. It's a regress. So that isn't going to work. What we have to do instead is to suppose that two minds overlap, that this volition is the same thing as the experiential in the other mind, which is a bit surprising because when you uh, intend to do something. For example, if I say the word boo, that is a volition in my mind, but you experience it as the sound. That isn't going to work in mental monism. Those two entities, the volition and the experience, even though they seem different, must be the same thing. And it seems like a volition to the agent mind, but is experienced as an experience by the recipient mind. So our first, sorry, fourth hypothesis, unitary mentations, that the minds composed of these unitary elements that are both volitions and uh, experiences. There's no intermediate mechanism between minds. We can resolve experiences into simple experiences. For example, the taste of Macallan and Freud, most people can tell the difference. They know 
the one text is different from the other text. But it takes an expert to resolve that experience into its component experiences. To taste Lefroy and say it's got this, this, and that. And with McCallan, again, resolving it into subsidiary experiences. So we understand from everyday experience that we can resolve compound experiences into smaller ones even though it takes skill to differentiate those component uh, experiences. That's the same with orchestral music or with colors. It doesn't have to be whiskey. But according to mental monism, we cannot resolve phenomena into non-phenomena. Everything has to be in consciousness, so we cannot have any of this proto-phenomenal stuff. There is no sub-phenomenal ingredients of reality. Reality is phenomenal all the way down to the bottom. Even though some of those experiences may be so basic, it takes a lot of skill to discern them. So hypothesis five, uh, there must be a small set of primitive experiential, which I'll refer to as elementary mentations, which is almost similar to Whitehead's notion of occasions of experience. What so, okay, so those are the elements of this model. What are the operators that are applied to them? Now, in mental ontogenesis, in other words, the creation of a mind, we start from little or nothing, and yet we somehow create lots of experiences. So that implies there must be some kind of creation operator that allows new mentations to come into being. And by symmetry, we might expect there to be a destruction operator too. So next hypothesis is that there are creation and destruction operators applying to mentations. So what we're aiming at here is the simplest possible model of the conscious mind within mental monism. Uh, there may be more kinds of mentations, there may be more kinds of operators. What I'm looking at is the most basic model that would actually work. So the picture we're getting here is that of parent and daughter mentations. So E1 creates E2, creates E3, and so on. So that chain can then create another one, EN plus 1, in a sort of mitosis-like fission. So each time a mentation creates a new one, it still exists by, by itself, but it now has a daughter mentation. Earlier mentations can also, well, there's no reason for it not to be fissile and to generate either a bud or what gives us a more rich model is to suppose there's what we would call in software a deep copy. So when E2 divides, it not only divides itself, but it duplicates the whole chain of daughters coming from it. Anyone who does computer programming is aware they are either a shallow copy or a deep copy. This is a deep copy. And that can happen time and time again. So E2 produces E1, 2, produces E2, 2, produces 3, 2. So we can imagine simply by this creation operator, generating an entire array of mentations. So next formal hypothesis is that there is a deep copy operation when we create a new mentation. How does a mentation decide what it's going to do? Well, it would be reasonable to suppose that it's the neighbors of a given mentation that are going to affect it, as opposed to ones far away. So let's suppose it's the four neighbors, the uh, parent, the child, and any siblings that have come about through deep copy. In other words, we have a hypothesis of local logic as opposed to remote logic. But then, bingo, we've got what is essentially a cellular automaton. Each mentation divides or doesn't divide according to the surrounding cells, the surrounding mentations. So that is a result from those hypotheses that we have a cellular automaton. But it's known that cellular automata are capable of embodying Turing universal Turing machines <clears throat> and are therefore able to do universal computation. So in other words, from that model, we can have a computational structure that can compute anything that can be computed. We can also imagine that there are multiple layers of these cellular automata. So each individual mentation can give rise to further chains and further chains. So what we have is essentially an object-oriented software system. The branching allows a hierarchy of cellular automata, so mentations can form an object-oriented computer. 
So the conclusion <clears throat> is that starting with minimal assumptions driven by the basic philosophy of mental monism, we can bootstrap a cellular automata system structured into an object-oriented architecture. I don't know if that's actually what happens in the world. My point is that I want to dismiss the notion we have to rely upon the deus ex machina, that God's going to come down and create the world. And, uh, some people have a straw man version of Berkeley and say that if we assume there's nothing but consciousness, we can still construct a rational model of reality. Now, obviously, there are zillions of possible uh, models of that system. They have to be constrained by what we can empirically find out about the uh, correlates of consciousness, the, the correlates within the physical construct of the conscious mind. For example, the Penrose Hammeroff microtubules, which have a, a, a tantalizing similarity to cellular automata. That may be pure coincidence, probably is. But uh, if we establish what the correlates are of consciousness within the physical construct, that gives us the constraints to enable us to determine which of those zillions of possible models is the right one. And that's the end of the talk. Thank you.